Hi everyone, today we'll be going over CBT Made Simple, A Clinician's Guide to Practicing Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. This book was written by Nina Josephwitz and David Myron and will be presented by me, Juliana, and later on, Daniela. Before we begin, we will be doing a land acknowledgement. We will be doing the Dish with One Spoon territory since this is where X University is located. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited to this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We will now begin with the book review, and we will start with part one, the CBT Foundations. This part of the book covers chapters one through four and discusses how to use CBT theory to understand your clients, focusing on your clients' strengths and problems, developing goals for therapy, and how to structure therapy sessions. We will begin with chapter one, and this chapter focuses on how we use CBT theory to understand clients. The agenda for this chapter includes the CBT building blocks, how thoughts and behaviors maintain problems, the role of underlying assumptions and core beliefs in maintaining problems, and the role of mindfulness in CBT. Throughout this presentation, you will often hear us reference the four-factor model, and this is because it is very widely used in CBT and is used throughout this book as well. This four-factor model is used to sort out thoughts, feelings, and physical reactions and behaviors separately from one another, but it's important to remember that change in one of the four factors can also influence any of the other three areas. And feelings and thoughts are often confused for one another, but differentiating between the two is one of the hardest skills to learn in CBT. We will be going over how this is done later on. Since feelings and thoughts are often confused for one another, I thought having a slide on terminology would be helpful. So feelings most often refers to emotional experiences, for example, feeling anxious, stressed, or sad. We also have automatic thoughts that happen very quickly and are just below our conscious awareness. This, an example of this could be a man approaches you on the street and you just assume he is dangerous. Thoughts are based on what a situation means to us or our interpretation. For example, I'm not good enough and good things never happen to me. There's also physical reactions, changes that occur in the body. For example, sweating, tingling, or having the feeling of butterflies in your stomach, as well as behavior. And this is what we do, such as sitting, talking, or going out in public. In cognitive behavioral therapy, the thoughts and feelings we keep to ourselves can often be compared to a crammed backpack. This is because the purpose of CBT is to help clients unpack this backpack. This is most oftenly done using the four factor model. This is used because clients often feel that the four factor model makes sense and they can use it immediately to understand their own distress. Along with this, clients begin to understand and maintain their problems along with feeling less overwhelmed and that change is possible. CBT therapists usually start with focusing on a client's automatic thoughts and behaviors, as this teaches basic skills and can lead to rapid improvements in therapy. Although we may not think about it, our thoughts and behaviors maintain the problems that occur in our everyday lives. Our thoughts about a situation often lead to our feelings, physical reactions, and behaviors. But different thoughts can lead to very different feelings, physical reactions, and behaviors. For example, a client comes in searching for a job, but receives a rejection letter. A positive thought, such as, I will try again, leaves the client feeling optimistic for their future of finding another job. However, a negative thought, such as, I am a failure, leaves the client feeling depressed and hopeless that they will never find another job again. Similarly to thoughts and behaviors, the role of underlying assumptions and core beliefs also has significance in maintaining problems in our everyday life. Behind all of our automatic thoughts are two types of underlying beliefs. These are underlying assumptions and core beliefs. Underlying assumptions are the rules, attitude, and assumptions we have that influence how we cope with life's challenges. Sometimes this is referred to as intermediate beliefs and are often the cause of our dysfunctional behavior. 
We also have core beliefs, which are deeply held beliefs about oneself, others, the world, and the future. These can be very general statements that are felt at a very deep level. They can be adapt adaptive or maladaptive and can be hard to identify or modify. This is because they're formed by early life experiences, but can also be modified later by other life experiences or trauma. Although CBT is a very effective form of therapy, it's very important to keep mindfulness in mind while performing this therapy. Mindfulness is a very good stress reducer and was actually adapted from traditional Buddhist meditation practices. Mindfulness is very important to everyday life, but many therapists are also increasingly introducing mindfulness to their practice. The two main ideas that come from mindfulness are paying attention to the present moment non-judgmentally with openness and curiosity. There's also the concept of diffusion or decentering, which is the idea that you are more than just your thoughts, feelings, and physical reactions. This is important in therapy because clients can often feel overwhelmed by their thoughts and feelings and physical reactions, but mindfulness can help reduce this. Chapter two will focus on your client's problems and strengths. The agenda for this chapter includes developing a good therapeutic relationship, understanding your client's presenting problems, understanding your client's stressors and strengths, and understanding your client's psychosocial history. In any type of social service profession, we are often taught to build rapport with the client. This is because it can help to develop a good therapeutic relationship. Effective therapy doesn't come out of nowhere. It happens in the context of a supportive relationship where the client feels accepted and understood by who they're talking to. This can help predict a positive outcome to come from therapy, as well as remaining empathetic is a large component of therapy and helps to understand the relationship and the client's problems better. Clients often present with more than one problem. If this is the case, it can be helpful to ask the client to make a list and explain the problem in their own words. If the client is having trouble with this, we can ask the client open-ended questions since this encourages exploration and in-depth answers. There are three main steps to go about obtaining initial information about your client's problems. One, ask about your client's problems. Two, explore how the problems are affecting their life. And three, collaboratively decide which problems to work on first. In addition to understanding your client's problems, you also need to understand how the problems fit into their overall life. Some clients may be reductive to share what goes on in their life, so some categories to ask about include family, friends, and social contacts, organizations or extracurricular activities they participate in, school or work if applicable, and you may also ask about their health and any drug or alcohol abuse. You might also ask about finances and self-care. In order for the client to see their strengths, they may need an outside perspective such as you, their therapist. Understanding your client's psychosocial history is extremely important when you first begin therapy. Most therapists spend an entire session on this because it is important to take a detailed history as you are trying to figure out how the client's experiences relate to their current problems. You are to listen for strengths, challenges, and areas of resilience that your client brings up. You may also ask clients how they feel about any specific events they speak about, as well as what it meant to them or what their thoughts were. There are five questions you can ask in regards to this. One, how did you understand this event? Two, how did you explain this event to yourself? Three, what did this event mean about you? Four, what did this event mean about other people? Five, what did this event mean about your future? Chapter three will cover how to develop goals for therapy. The agenda for this chapter includes setting goals, developing specific and measurable goals, and the first goal focus. Setting goals is important to CBT because it can help the client feel as if they have achieved more. In order to do this, you should work together to agree on goals and write them down. This helps keep the therapeutic relationship strengthened. You should also make a specific and clear goal for the client. 
but if the client has more than one problem, you can definitely focus on one or two first. However, please keep in mind that as therapy progresses, goals can change. In CBT, the more specific and measurable the goal is, the more helpful it will be to the client. Clients usually have general goals such as, I want to be a better person. But the problem with this is that it does not give a specific idea of how the client wants their life to be different. Asking questions such as, if you met your goal, how do you think your life would be different? What would you be doing differently? And how would you behave in these situations? helps give clients a more specific idea of the goal they wish to achieve. Once again, if your client has more than one problem, you can start with one or two goals as the first goal. You should start with goals that are doable and have a high chance of success, otherwise this can be discouraging or unmotivationable to the client. When therapy helps clients make changes, clients become more committed to the therapy process and hopeful that their lives will change. Chapter four will cover how to structure your sessions. The agenda for this chapter includes how to organize your therapy sessions, check in before the session, setting and working the agenda, developing homework for your clients, and reviewing the session. Just like having goals for therapy, having structure to the session as well as assigning homework is extremely beneficial to all aspects of therapy. It helps make the chances of therapy more successful. Structuring is one of the most helpful CBT skills clients can learn. There are five basic components to this. Checking in, setting the agenda, working the agenda, doing homework, and review. Before you begin the week's new session with the client, it is important to check in on new developments happening in the client's life and how they have been feeling since the last session. During this time, you should rate, ask the client to rate their overall mood since the last session. You should also bridge the last session and ask about any issues you were previously concerned about. During this time, you can also review past week's homework and identify new issues and see if they would like to discuss this today. After checking in with the client, you may begin setting and working the agenda with them. You should work together with the client to make a list of what they want to focus on. This is a very client-focused approach to practice. During this time, you will set the expectations that therapy is not just about coming and talking for an hour, that the therapist expects the client to work on specific problems and give thought to what they want to talk about. Therapy sessions can easily drift but if this occurs, just let the client know that they have drifted and if they would like to focus on this drift or on the initial agenda item. After speaking about the agenda item for the week, you may develop homework for your clients. Homework is an opportunity for clients to practice in everyday life what they have worked on in therapy. This makes therapy much more effective and clients are more likely to make changes in their lives. 62% of clients improved when therapy included homework. You only need to leave 5 to 10 minutes at the end of the session to plan homework. Criteria to develop helpful homework includes homework not being assigned in a rushed manner, developed with the help of the client, have specific and concrete goals and relating to the session, and make sure it is doable for the client. After you have completed the session for the week, you should go back and review the session with the client. During this time, you may ask clients to review, and this helps them remember what was covered. You may ask questions such as, what was most important to you from the session today? Remind them to write down anything they would like to remember, and ask them to stop and summarize what we talked about, and how would you like to put what we talked about into your own words? Part two of this book focuses on understanding your client's problems. It runs through chapters five through seven, and goes over how to identify your client's feelings, physical reactions, and behaviors, which of your client's thoughts should you focus on, and how to identify your client's thoughts. Chapter five of the book goes over how to identify your client's feelings, physical reactions, and behaviors. The agenda for this chapter includes, uh, once again, what is the four-factor model and how is it used in therapy, how to identify your client's triggers and reactions, 
identifying your client's feelings, physical reactions, and behaviors, and how to remain empathetic during a session. In CBT, the four-factor model is used in situations where the client feels triggered. This model helps pause the negative automatic thoughts that a client may be thinking. It is a process of self-reflection, and it helps the client identify their situation, their thoughts, feelings, physical reactions, and behaviors. Some therapists also recommend writing down the cl client's reactions as well as clients to write down their own thoughts and feelings as well. This can help make it more effective. Another difficult aspect of CBT is identifying your client's triggers and reactions. This may be difficult because sometimes clients don't recognize their own triggers and their reactions to these triggers. You must first identify what situations cause what reaction in your client. The first step is to ask the client to monitor their problematic feelings and behavior. This helps the client become more specific and concrete about their problems. During this time, you may also ask the W questions. These questions may involve what happened, who was involved, where did it happen, and when did it happen? After identifying your client's triggers and reactions, you may identify your client's feelings, physical reactions, and behaviors. In regards to feelings, labeling them is healthy and shows that you are interested in what the client is saying and feeling. You may also ask the client to notice their feelings during the week, and if they start to identify these feelings, to write them down. Thoughts are very closely related to feelings, so it can be hard to differentiate, but we went over how to do this earlier. You may also ask the client to rate their feelings throughout the week. In regards to physical reactions, these are often clues to our feelings, as it is how our body reacts. Unless the client is able to identify their physical reactions, we cannot explore what these mean to them. In regards to behavior, we need a clear and specific description of the client's behavior. There are specific versus vague. In a situation where my father told me I should not have dropped out of school, a vague behavior description would be I withdrew, while a specific behavior would be I sat at the dining room table completely silent for the rest of the meal. Once again, remaining empathetic during a session is critically important. Although CBT is structured, it is not rigid and the therapeutic relationship is critically important. Using summary statements and asking open questions are key counseling skills for maintaining an empathetic relationship while adhering to the structure of CBT. Chapter six will focus on which of your client's thoughts should you focus on. The agenda for this chapter is identifying hot thoughts, identifying if the thought is an unrealistic evaluation of self, others, or the future, identifying if the thought explains your client's feelings, and identifying if the thought contains a cognitive distortion. We may identify hot thoughts because they are thoughts that are worth working on explaining the meaning of the situation and are strongly connected to intense feelings. When you are first learning CBT, it can be hard to know which thoughts are hot thoughts and which are worth focusing on. There are three guidelines to identify if this is a hot thought. One, is this thought an unrealistic evaluation of self, others, or the future? Does this thought explain your client's feelings? And three, does this thought contain a cognitive distortion? Although hot thoughts may be difficult to identify, they significantly help you in your practice as they help you understand a client's distress. You may ask additional questions to identify the following. If it is an evaluation of self, these are contain thoughts that are judgmental about oneself. Example, something is wrong with me. If it is an evaluation of others, it will contain thoughts that are judgmental about other people or an expectation about how other people will treat you, such as my boss will be disappointed in me. Or if it is an evaluation of the future, this will contain thoughts that are judgmental of the future or an expectation of what the future will be like. For example, I will never find another good job. Sometimes when a client's thoughts don't match their feelings, this is a sign that you need to keep exploring how to identify their underlying thoughts. These thoughts may include anxiety, so you need to make sure you understand what bad thing your client is expecting to happen. If it is depression, 
the client will be speaking about loss and hopelessness, and this will include negative thoughts about oneself, others, or the future. If they are angry, this anger is usually directed at other people. It, the client can feel disempowered, disrespected, or put down and react with anger. And this anger is actually closely related to depression and hopelessness. In addition to this, there's also guilt and shame. These often go together, relating to believing that we have hurt someone and guilty is feeling like we should have behaved better or differently. These are all very difficult thoughts to have and having a CBT therapist can help you unload these thoughts. Commonly, the many thoughts your clients have will often contain a cognitive distortion. Cognitive distortion is commonly used in CBT and is a very familiar concept to those who practice this type of therapy. However, you should be cautious using this term as distortion or distorted usually suggests some type of negativity. Instead, many therapists have begun using the term thinking traps. This relates to how clients typically respond to situations that trigger them. And the purpose of identifying this is that it is to have a label that the client feels captures their experience in a situation. This also typically focuses on the negative details of a situation while other positive aspects are overlooked. So we want to make sure that while the negative details are supportive, we also want positive aspects to not be overlooked. Chapter seven will focus on identifying your client's thoughts. The agenda for this chapter includes how to identify automatic thoughts, asking helpful questions, working with the client and using additional strategies to identify thoughts, determining which questions to ask, and linking thoughts to feelings, physical reactions, and behaviors. In CBT, identifying automatic thoughts is encouraged by using the just ask questions. These include general probing questions such as, what were you thinking? What were you saying yourself to the time? And what was running through your mind? We can also use prompting questions such as any other thoughts or anything else. We can also use reflective statements such as, so you were thinking, repeating their last thought, or clarifying questions such as, can you tell me more about that thought? When asking these questions, we need to use a gentle and curious tone that encourages the client to self-reflect. Along with identifying automatic thoughts, it is also important to ask helpful questions in CBT. These questions usually have to do with what does the situation mean to your client? One way to discover what a situation means to your client is to ask them directly, and we can use any of the following questions. What does this situation mean to you? What does this situation mean about you, other people, or the future? Or what is it about this situation that is so distressing to you? These questions focus on feelings instead or in combination with other aspects of CBT. Listing the client's worries can also help manage their own anxiety. As Sometimes clients may be reluctant to answer the just ask questions. When this is the case, asking them to imagine themselves back in their situation is often a good idea. However, it is important to only do this if it is safe to do so. This is because Asking clients to imagine themselves back in their situation can be triggering, especially in patients with PTSD. While exploring images, we need to recognize that strong negative feelings are often accompanied by intense effect-provoking images. These images can be about the past, and it has long been known that clients with post-traumatic stress disorder frequently have intrusive images in the form of flashbacks of their traumatic event. Some clients may be able to easily identify their images. However, many clients only become aware of their images when specifically asked whether images accompany their emotional reaction. You may try this with your clients. While doing this, you may start with a general question, such as, do you have any images or memories connected with this situation? You may also then explore their worries. Many clients who are anxious have very clear images of their feared event occurring. If this is the case, be sure to ask whether they have actually have seen the worst case scenario happen in their mind. You may also ask about images that accompany your client's feelings, such as, do you have any images or memories that accompany your feelings? Or when you have this feeling, do you ever see pictures or images in your mind of yourself or other people? 
You may also ask about images that accompany your client's verbal thoughts. Clients often have thoughts about themselves, such as, I don't fit in, or thoughts about others or their future. Thoughts may also be hopes or questions. Thoughts that are hopes or questions pose unique challenges because they do not clearly explain the meaning of the situation. Shifts in a client's mood can also be used as an additional strategy. This is when clients talk about a difficult situation and often become emotional. A shift in your client's mood usually goes with an important thought about themselves, others, or the future. In CBT, determining which questions to ask can often be difficult as there is no right answer. This is a summary of the questions therapist Nina Jovowitz, an author of this book, uses and the general order in which she uses them. The more you use these questions, the more they will start to feel natural to yourself, your clients, and your therapy process. These questions include, what were you thinking? Any other thoughts? When a client's mood shifts, ask them what they were thinking just before their mood shifted. What does the situation mean to you? Or what does the situation mean about yourself, others, or your future? How is this a situation a problem for you? What are some of the thoughts that go with your feelings? Let's make a list of your worries. Do you have a worst case scenario? Do you have any images? If the thought is a question, how do you imagine this question in your mind? If the thought is a hope, what are you worried about? Finally, at this point in therapy, you have identified a specific situation that is problematic for your client and you've explored your client's reaction using the four factor model. Identifying the relationships among the four factors provides your client with a structure for understanding what is maintaining their problems and provides you with a way of organizing your client's treatments. This worksheet, Understand Your Reaction, comes in handy between you and your client, as you have a document you can look at when developing a model to understand the factors that are maintaining their problems. Ask the client to look over the Understand Your Reaction worksheet and ask if they see a connection among the four factors. Often a client will comment that their reaction makes more sense or that given their thoughts, it makes sense how they are feeling and behaving. If a client does not see a link between their thoughts and feelings, physical reactions and behaviors, I point it out to them. This only benefits them. Part three will discuss cognitive and behavioral interventions. Chapter eight, look for evidence and create balanced thoughts. In this section, we will discuss what are thought records, how to look for proof of adverse thinking, and how to create a balanced thought. What are thought records? A thought record can be utilized by clients to point out a particular issue situation and share what their feelings and thoughts are. Then, one of these thoughts will be focused on. It is important to make sure that this thought is a hot thought. It can be helpful to add physical reactions and behavior if you wish to use them. While it's not required, it can be helpful to ask about how much they hold true the balanced thought and to reshare feelings after there has been evaluation of proof and they have worked towards a comprehensive balanced thought. If clients observe this proof for the thoughts, it can stop the instinctive negative reactions, allowing for reflexivity and spacing themselves away from this instinctive thought. Steps to finishing a thought record according to the author include identify a problematic situation, identify and rate feelings, identify physical reactions, identify behaviors, identify thoughts, choose a hot thought. A reminder, hot thoughts are those connected to adverse feelings and an adverse assessment of the self, others, or the future. Look for evidence for and against the hot thought. Create a balanced or alternative thought based on all the evidence. Rate the extent to which you believe the new balanced thought. And rate the feelings now that you have examined all the evidence. It is important to note that identifying physical reactions and behaviors, as well as rating the extent to which they believe the new balanced thought and their feelings after they have examined the evidence, are not required steps. Many thought records will be done and worked through throughout the sessions to challenge negative thinking. If there are two or more hot thoughts that are causing negative feelings, pick one and work from there. Socratic questioning can be beneficial. It allows the client to observe the presumptions around their thoughts, look at what was previously overlooked, 
or observe a certain circumstance from a new lens. This can be done in two ways. You can ask open-ended questions to allow them to think, or to recap what was stated and wait for the client to think about it. How to look for proof of adverse thinking. First, you're going to want to describe this idea of looking for proof. The client will learn how to observe their thoughts for validity rather than treating them as true and factual. In order to assist in deconstructing negative thinking, you must have a grasp on what evidence is used to uphold these thoughts. This can be done by having the client write it down or say it out loud. It is critical that the therapist is accepting and sympathetic. You can also ask about previous lived experiences that have a correlation to their current negative thinking. Here, they can begin to draw the lines between what may have been accurate before may not have the same accuracy now. Clients will often hover on what can enforce their negative thoughts. Assist them by allowing them to see the aspects they traditionally turn away from that would dispute their negative thoughts. Three questions suggested by the author to observe what can dispute a hot thought include, is there evidence that contradicts my negative thoughts? How probable is my negative prediction? Is there another perspective? It can be important to inquire about any situations or lived experiences that diminish the validity of a hot thought. The proof of this must be comprehensive. Often clients will have a more comprehensive proof for the hot thought, meaning the disputing proof is less comprehensive. It becomes critical to have a more specific evidence that challenges it to create more emotional involvement. More questions that can help to dispute the proof for a hot thought as suggested by the author include, what would you say to someone who thought this way? What do you think a friend or someone who cared for you would say if they knew you had this thought? If you were in a better mood, what would you think? Is there any information that contradicts your interpretation, even small pieces of information? Is there any positive information that you are ignoring? When the adverse thinking concerns future worries, search for proof that can lead to the actual probability of the foreseen outcome happening. Steps for this may include Look for what your client worries will occur. Make sure this list is as comprehensive as it can be. Assign a rating for the likelihood these events will happen. From there, observe the proof for the likelihood that the event will happen, and then re-rate the likelihood in a similar manner as before, after breaking down the proof. Because negative thinking can be based on an excessively adverse outlook of an experience, you want to assist the client in looking for a more neutral outlook on this event. Occasionally, you can ask about another perspective in order to get them to think about it in a different manner. However, this is not always the case. Sometimes you will need to look for actual proof, and this will allow the client to take their narrow view and widen it. Observe whether the client is criticizing themselves or their role in a situation that they lack command over. Then, strengthen the proof that disputes the hot thought. Most clients highlight the proof that reinforces negative thinking, which weakens the proof that disputes this but it is critical to observe the facts in these situations. Reviewing can be in, utilized in order to develop new thinking processes. If the client writes it down, it allows the client to have something to take home with them after the appointment, and this can be helpful. If you write it down, be sure to share and vocalize what you are writing with the client. In these situations, imagery can be useful. If they imagine memories or experiences that can dispute the hot thought, it can benefit the process. How to create a balanced thought. Go back and assess the hot thought and develop a balanced thought that encapsulates all the evidence. Questions proposed by the author include, when you look at the evidence, what does this say about your original hot thought? When you look at all the evidence, what could be a more accurate thought? What might be a thought that captures all the evidence? Let's take a moment and look at the evidence. What did you learn? You initially interpreted the situation in a specific way. When you look at the evidence, is there another interpretation that either makes more sense or might be equally true? And finally, what would you tell someone who thought the way you did and had all this evidence? Before the thought record is finished, you need to inquire from 1 to 100 how much they accept the balanced thought. Then ask if they do accept this thought, how would this impact their feelings? Then they re-rate their feelings. It is important to then review the new balanced thought. This can be done by sharing the balanced thought aloud and placing a compliment with it can be encouraging.
get the client to say their thought out loud. Get the client to also overview the thought on a regular basis. It can be beneficial to create a metaphor or image as this can create more of a connection to it, allowing the client to easily recall it. Remind your client that the balanced thoughts can be used to counter stress as they often reduce anxiety and depression and can increase self-esteem. As well remind them that the balanced thoughts do not just need to be applied to the focused area or hot thought, they can be used across a variety of situations. Some important points to consider include that the proof that's used must dispute the hot thought that you are actively working through at the time. The balanced thought must be an approach to counter the hot thought. For instance, if the thought surrounds the self, ensure that the balanced thought does as well. When the session is completed, use some time on your own to overview the thought record. Chapter 9, Problem Solving, Finding a Better Way. In this section, we will discuss what is problem solving, how to create a positive problem orientation, how to recognize an issue, working to improve the client's situation, and how to create coping thoughts. What is problem solving? Problem solving requires an outlook that any issues can be resolved or improved upon, as well as acting in a way that requires a particular grouping of skills. Four steps as proposed by the author for this include, identify the problem and set realistic goals, generate new solutions through brainstorming, evaluate the different solutions and decide which one to try, try one of these solutions, evaluate the consequences, then decide whether the problem is solved or you need to go back and continue to problem solve. The theory behind this strategy is that the client's emotional stress and struggles are because they often lack the skills to problem solve efficiently, which leads to maladaptive methods of coping. When the therapist assists the client in problem solving, it sends the message that they are important and that you care for them, which delivers an influential message. Problem solving has been evidently effective, citing that it leads to an improved emotional adjustment, whereas a lack of problem solving skills can cause more stress and poorer adjustment. How to create a positive problem orientation. It is significant to be able to create a positive problem orientation as this is a central theme in problem solving. What is it? It's the ability to view obstacles as a regular complication in life where the individual has the ability to look for solutions to these obstacles. However, a negative problem orientation means that people tend to ignore these obstacles or handle them in a negative way. It is critical that you increase motivation for problem solving. To do this, you can start by having a positive attitude towards the client's future success at problem solving. Some phrases as suggested by the author include, let's see if we can find a way to solve your problems. I wonder if there is something you can do that will help the situation. I know it feels hopeless, but I wonder if we could find a way to make things even a little better for you. Or, I'm not sure we've looked at all the possible solutions. Would you be willing to try to problem solve? There can be issues if the client is too distressed to follow through with the successful problem solving as they are usually told that they need to stop during these times of distress. Therefore, wait until they are in a better mindset to begin problem solving. How to recognize an issue. Prior to solving any issues, they first need to be pointed out and recognized. Therefore, the beginning steps include identifying the issue and setting goals. With some clients, it may be easy to point out problems and other times this may be more challenging. If a client has a negative problem orientation, it's common they will ignore their problems or experience feelings of anxiety. When defining a problem, ensure that it's detailed and comprehensive as this will be more helpful when trying to brainstorm resolutions. Setting goals is a critical step in problem solving. Ensure they are detailed and comprehensive, but they also need to be practical. Be sure to include both short-term and long-term goals. After issues and obstacles have been identified, goals should be easier to figure out. However, if this isn't the case, the author suggests some questions you can ask, such as, how would your client like the situation to change or be different? How would your client like other people in the situation to change or be different? Or how would your client like to change or be different? Goal setting can be easier if the therapist pays notice to what the client wishes will happen as a result of the behaviors they currently have. Then highlight the actual consequences of the behavior, as the client will not find the motivation to problem solve without the realization that their current behaviors aren't benefiting them. Another useful step is to explain problem solving to the client. 
For this, it can be beneficial to give a rundown of what problem solving is, how it works, and be sure to create hope that this will benefit the client. Working to improve the client situation. You will begin by brainstorming solutions. This can be more challenging as the client will need to think outside of the box of how they usually think. Principles as outlined by the author include quantity, which is trying to generate as many solutions as possible, variety, which is the bigger the variety, the more chances you will find a good idea, and deferred judgment, where you will write down all the solutions no matter how irrelevant or silly they appear. When finding new solutions, collaboration is very important as it can build empowerment when the client makes choices for themselves and is more involved in the process. Some clients may find this difficult, whereas others may not. But if this is an issue, the author outlines some questions that the client can be asked. These include, what are some different ways you could handle your problem? What would you suggest to someone who has this problem? What do you think a friend or someone who cares for you would suggest if they knew you had this problem? How have you handled similar situations in the past? How do you overcome obstacles in other areas of your life? Is there any positive information that you are ignoring? that could be helpful in solving this problem? Or is there anything that cannot be changed and that you have to accept? After brainstorming solutions, you will pick one of them. By overlooking and assessing the choices of solutions, it can create a sense of empowerment for clients. Ensure to ask these questions proposed by the author in order to allow the client to make the best choice. These questions include, what are the short and long-term benefits of each solution? And what are the short and long-term drawbacks of each solution? Answers for this can be written down to make it easier to remember and reassess their choices. Provide these questions to clients in order to allow them to think about the solutions as proposed by the author. How will this situation affect me, other people, and the situation? How will I feel after implementing this solution? Is this solution consistent with my values? Will implementing this solution be important to me in terms of acting on my values? Does the solution generally feel doable? And does the solution feel doable in terms of time and effort required? There are some important steps for this, but begin by creating a plan that is detailed and comprehensive. Include what will be done and be sure to be specific on what their first step is, the timeline, and be sure to look for any barriers in completing this. But still be ready for the possibility that it may not go well. This means the client should be aware of any risks for an adverse outcome so that they can best prepare themselves. As well, imagery can be a powerful tool to prepare and figure out any potential barriers. If barriers are discovered, solve them to make the plan more achievable and reimagine the scenario a few more times. Ensure you collaborate on the ability to complete the task. Finally, the client must go out and attempt the solution. This must be looked at on a continuum rather than it going well or not going well. Prior to this, ensure that the client and the therapist have discussed measures of evaluation on the success of the solution. It's also important to ensure that even if it's not entirely successful, the client understands that they did well for trying it and they should celebrate that. How to create coping thoughts. A coping thought will be highlighted to ensure that the solution is managed well and the client can deal with any negative feelings that may arise. The general process for this includes figuring out what the behavior your client wants to change is and work on a plan. Make sure it is detailed and achievable. See if your client's current thoughts are negatively impacting their plan. You can inquire to see if they have a grasp on how their thoughts can affect their success in completing this plan. From there, develop a coping thought. This will assist in coping with a given situation and assist with negative thinking. It will also allow the client to be more compassionate towards themselves. From there, in order to practice coping thoughts, you can use imagery with your client. Chapter 10, Behavioral Activation, Action Plans for Depression. In this section, we will discuss what is behavioral activation, uses for treatment of depression, steps for implementing behavioral activation, and boosting well-being. What is behavioral activation? Depression can be defined as a process that is created and upheld through avoidance and missing aspects of positive reinforcement. Due to alterations within the client's life, there are less experiences that create pleasure and happiness and more experiences of unpleasant events, causing a worsening in mood where these activities they enjoyed become less enjoyable. 
This means that there are less positive reinforcements in their lives, ruining their routines and any normal behaviors they once had. In order to disrupt this cycle, behavioral activation can be used as it directly observes the aspect of depression that causes avoidance and creates more positive mood-boosting activities that aim to be enjoyable, add confidence, allow for the lessening of negative results of avoiding behaviors. It is important to make sure that the activities can be worked on throughout the week in a step-by-step -step manner and that the problem-solving approach discussed earlier can allow to solve any barriers. This allows the clients to have an improved mood, start to do certain activities again, and create a healthy routine. Behavioral activation has a hopeful outcome for a client to go back to how they were able to live prior to the depression. Clients will be motivated to complete activities regardless of how they feel. The process as outlined by the author includes understanding your client's depression in relations to changes in their daily activities, monitor your client's daily activities, plan activities that increase positive mood, monitor your client's mood before and after activities, problem solve any obstacles that may happen, and establish healthy routines and prevent setbacks. Uses for treatment of depression. It is important to assist a client in acknowledging how their depression is caused by missing mood boosting experiences and it's not because of their own shortcomings. If they can acknowledge this, they gain more motivation to complete behaviors that will improve their mood. This is especially significant as a therapist will be encouraging them to complete activities regardless of whether they feel like doing it. Begin by observing how things changed for the client prior to the depression. Especially look for activities that would improve mood being avoided or lost in their routine. Observe coping methods or avoidance when you do this. You can ask, what life changes occurred prior to your depression? Or how did these changes affect your daily life activities in relation to an increase or decrease in pleasurable activities? Utilizing a recap that has been written down can be helpful to track any changes. Analogies can also be used to help the client understand the role the lack of activities that will improve their mood has on their depression. The image to the right is a cycle that depicts depression after a trigger situation. It begins with a decrease in positive events and an increase in negative ones. It shows how this affects mood and thoughts and leads to avoidance. Then it shows additional issues and a lack of positive routine before the cycle begins again. Steps for implementing behavioral activation. It is imperative to encourage clients to do behaviors that follow the plan rather than act based on how they feel. They will begin to draw lines between the activities they do and an increase in overall mood, which will in turn increase their motivation. The simplest way to complete this is to watch daily activities and track mood. To figure out what the client learned, you can use activities they do to track activity and mood correlations and find when and what activities you wish to grow on. Questions to do this as proposed by the author include, do you see an activity mood relationship? What activities help you feel better and what activities or situations are connected to a low mood? What time periods are you most at risk for a low mood? Do you have any routines that help you maintain a positive mood? Or is there anything you are avoiding? Activities that should be added include basic living activities such as eating, wearing clean clothes, sleeping normally, or basic chores, socializing, exercising, and any other activity that the client enjoys. Guidelines as stated by the author to create activity plans that will be effective include that they are developed collaboratively, they have to be specific, concrete, and doable, they must be naturally reinforcing. It's important that they follow a regular routine, such as a weekly class. And the client must be able to practice being mindful and concentrate on the activity in the moment. As can be expected, there may be issues in completing certain activities. This is where you can ask about what caused the issue and what the client was thinking at the time. Ensure that you work with the client to problem solve and ensure them that you are still hopeful. If you only have a few sessions, you can begin by discussing why a particular activity no longer provides happiness. Explain this correlation between activities and mood and collaborate to create activity plans. It can be easy for clients to fall back into the cycle. To ensure this is less likely to occur, a strong routine is required. If feelings of depression begin again, clients should observe their daily routine and add activities to their routine. They can also observe what activities they normally do that they are now avoiding. 
After this, you can use graded task assignments. These are used when the client is not completing their activities. Ensure you break down the complete activity, taking one portion and working on it, and then moving on to the next, as breaking it up can make your client feel that they are making change. Making a timeline can also be beneficial. Boosting well-being. A few things that can be added to their routine that will increase well-being includes socializing with loved ones, journaling one to three good experiences the client had within the day, journaling one to three things that they are appreciative for every day, and if an event that is causing the client anxiety is approaching, have them demonstrate the best outcome in that situation. Chapter 11, Exposure Therapy, Clients Face Their Fears. In this section, we will discuss the cycle of avoidance, what is exposure therapy, and steps for exposure therapy. This image depicts a cycle that begins with an anxiety-provoking situation which leads to a prediction from the client. This prediction causes anxiety which leads to avoidance. Avoiding the situation further leads to consequences, which means that the individual never has the opportunity to test their prediction for accuracy. Then the cycle begins again. What is exposure therapy? Exposure therapy is a way of treating anxiety by having a client move through situations that they have feared, step by step, increasing in difficulty each time. Ensure to collaborate with the client about what the source of their anxiety is and planning. This theory is based on the premise that avoiding particular situations will continue the feelings of anxiety that surround it. Safety behaviors are what are used to avoid and allow feelings of fear to continue. However, they impact everyday functioning. These include avoiding, rechecking, rehearsing, or keeping something nearby that is not required for safety, but allows the client to feel safer. It is important that safety behaviors are pointed out. You can ask your client about them so that they can identify what they are. There are three types of exposure therapy, all of which have their benefits. The first is in vivo, which exposes the client directly to the source of their anxiety. Then there is virtual, which requires the use of a medium to create the situation that causes the anxiety. Finally is imaginal, which is using the client's imagination to experience the events. This can be beneficial when other types are not available, and it is also good for working on trauma. It is critical to point out that if the client lacks impulse control, is struggling with substance abuse or misuse, experiences suicidal thoughts, or actively harms themselves when stress is experienced, do not start exposure therapy at this point. Wait until they are better before beginning. There are three steps to exposure therapy, which include preparing, implementing, and debriefing. Steps for exposure therapy. The first step of exposure therapy is to prepare to do the exposure, which includes helping the client figure out which source they want to work on, explain how their avoidance allows for the continuance of fear, a rundown of the process of exposure, and then working in a collaboration on a hierarchy or a ladder of the source. This will rate through subjective units of stress on a scale of 1 to 100. After this, you add the exposure. First create the activity, but make sure the first one is simple enough to complete. The suggested rating is 30 to 40. Ensure this is comprehensive and that the client can determine their success. It will not be descriptive of the client's feelings, but what they will be doing. And it is important that the client remains in control. For this first task, you can complete it with them to act as a support. Then move up the latter, but as a general rule, feelings of fear must be reduced by half before proceeding. While this is recommended, it is important to know what the client needs and to act on their needs. Make sure that the exposure can be efficient. Some guidelines proposed by the author include that tasks should be frequent and prolonged, tasks should be varied and done in multiple contexts, exposure should be mindful, safety behavior should be eliminated quickly, and in between sessions, exposure tasks should be assigned. It can also be beneficial to ask the client what they assume will go wrong. Follow this by asking for a rating on the probability of this occurring, and then ask about their reaction and the probability of their reaction occurring. After this, it is important to debrief the end results and the levels of anxiety. Often these can be used later to dispute the predictions. During debrief, look at what was predicted and if it actually occurred. Some of the guidelines the author provides include the accuracy of the client's initial predictions, the danger of the situation, the client's ability to cope with the task and their anxiety, 
and what happens to anxiety with exposure. Also be sure to check in with the client and see what they learned and review this. After this, it is important that the client keeps up with these activities and that the therapist explains how to avoid a relapse in these situations. In part four, we will discuss working with underlying beliefs. Chapter 12, working with core beliefs. In this section, we will discuss what are core beliefs, how to work through unhealthy core beliefs, and finding new healthy core beliefs. What are core beliefs? When using a core belief in a therapy setting, it is important to ensure that all of these guidelines are met. You have a strong relationship with the client, there should be a few sessions before so that you have worked together. It should be closer to the beginning of a session so that there is enough time to deconstruct the core thought. The client needs to be in a better emotional state. And the client must have moved through some CBT steps and have already seen the pros of CBT. Core beliefs are firm beliefs that impact how the individual will feel and react to a particular situation. These can be difficult to change. They can influence how we see a situation, the thoughts and feelings that arise, and our behavior. This means that core beliefs can impact what aspects an individual would pick up on and keep in their memory with regards to a particular situation. How to work through unhealthy core beliefs. There are three different forms of self-judgment that core beliefs surround as stated by the author, such as an individual's competency, their ability to be loved, and their worth. This is often correlated to childhood abuse. Noticing this can be critical to reshaping core beliefs. It is important to deconstruct these core beliefs in order to form healthier core beliefs. To do this, look for proof that allows their core belief to live, and there are two steps to do this. First, observe which experience caused this thought and work on allowing them to see the situation in a different way. Then work on creating healthier core beliefs. What would the client like to believe about themselves? It's an important thing to think about. Finding new healthy core beliefs. There are three strategies to do this, which include positive data logs, the continuum method, and deconstructing old behavior patterns. Using a positive data log will strengthen this new belief. It should consist of two sections, the proof that has been discussed and the correlation between this proof and the new core belief. The next is continuum methods. This is where the therapist will point out what causes core beliefs. Request the client rate a basic core belief and what upholds this in relation to themselves. They should rate this as well. When they look at this, point out how the rating they gave themselves differs. Finally, deconstruct old behavior patterns. The client should act that their new core belief is accurate, whether or not they hold it to be true yet, as eventually they will believe it. To improve the new core belief, it's critical that clients have healthy daily activities, continuously practice this belief, they use mindfulness techniques, and ask clients to consistently mention what is positive in their lives. Chapter 13, Underlying Assumptions and Behavioral Experiments. In this section, we will discuss what are underlying assumptions, determining unhealthy underlying assumptions, how to determine the correctness of an underlying assumption, and improving underlying assumptions. What are underlying assumptions? Underlying assumptions are what we believe to be true about how the world functions, which impacts how we act in various situations. For instance, we can discuss an assumption about the world being unsafe. We learn these through childhood experiences teaching them to us, such as gathering them through family, or they're ingrained through lived experiences, such as bullying. There's a correlation between core beliefs, underlying assumptions, and how clients cope. Core beliefs become the foundation for how we can view ourselves, others, or the future. Underlying assumptions then put these beliefs into our behaviors and outlook of the world. This ensures we keep ourselves from harm and use behaviors that line up with the core belief. Determining unhealthy underlying assumptions. There are two ways therapists can point out an unhealthy underlying assumption. First, by either listening actively as they describe their experiences, or you can outright ask the client. Look at behaviors that are an issue that you want to focus on, and then point out the underlying assumption and what end result the client wishes to achieve. Then, summarize all of this for them. Questions you can ask if you want the client to point out the underlying assumption include, what does your client hope will be the consequence of their identified behavior? 
What does your client imagine will happen if they do not do the identified behavior? And what does your client imagine will happen if they do the opposite of the identified behavior? How to determine the correctness of an underlying assumption. To test how true an underlying assumption is through cognitive approaches, you can write it down or get the client to elaborate on true consequences for the behavior, including how the situation may be altered and how others might be impacted. If you're doing a behavioral experiment, collaboratively create one that would examine the accuracy and make sure it's possible. There are two types of behavioral experiments. There's the direct action experiment, which will outright test the underlying assumption or observational experiments, which will help to find out what the belief is and then examine whether or not it's accurate. Ensure, as always, that this is reviewed with the client. Then, have the client discuss whether or not their prediction is true. If possible, you can work with clients to create healthier underlying assumptions and further ones to test later on. Improving underlying assumptions. Sometimes clients may find it difficult to apply this new belief to their life. Therefore, it's critical that they know they should practice it and consistently review their behavior for the best outcome. Part 5, CBT in Action. Chapter 14, Treatment Guidelines in Suzanne and Raoul's Therapy. In this section, we will discuss tips for CBT in depression, tips for CBT in anxiety, and how to terminate therapy. Tips for CBT, depression. The most important thing is that you always ensure that you understand the client's issues and fit the session to their needs. Guidelines for treating depression include using the four-factor model in order to get a grasp on their depression and how these factors impact their circumstance. From there, focus on the behaviors. Behavioral activation can be useful for this. For clients that are severely depressed, don't focus on thoughts as of yet. Instead, provide sleep hygiene techniques, and once their depression is improved, move on to focus on thoughts. Figure out whether or not depression is caused by adverse thoughts on the self or hopelessness. If there are many symptoms, start with behavioral activation and if the depression isn't severe, you can focus on anxiety as well. To summarize, with depression, the most important things to consider are an aim to point out behaviors that allow depression to continue, using activities that can improve mood, using sleep hygiene and other activities to improve mood and overall energy, and observing negative thoughts, proof for thoughts, and cognitive distortions in a sympathetic manner. This diagram shows the four factors, thoughts, physical reactions, behaviors, and moods, and how they interact with each other and the symptoms of depression. Tips for CBT, anxiety. Guidelines for treating anxiety use the four-factor model as well. During the first session, get a grasp on how the factors perpetuate anxiety. You can use physical symptoms, automatic thoughts, and avoidance. For physical symptoms, use relaxation methods like progressive muscle relaxation. With regards to thoughts, look at fears about the future and work on those by determining the likelihood that they will actually happen. With anxiety, the most important things to focus on include encouraging clients to use relaxation techniques to help physical symptoms. Sleep hygiene can be useful here as well. Observe which thoughts maintain anxiety, specifically with regards to predictions and what proof actually exists, and then assist the client through exposure therapy, problem solving, and other methods mentioned previously in order to stop the behavior of avoidance. This diagram shows the four factors, thoughts, physical reactions, behaviors, and moods, and how they interact with each other and the symptoms of anxiety. How to terminate therapy. When terminating therapy with a client, you can offer to meet again in two weeks to overview what was learned and what occurred during this break. Ensure that the client knows that you are always available to discuss and have another session if they ever require it. That concludes the presentation. Thank you so much for listening.